this beautiful earth, we as a collective call it home. Good evening, guys. Welcome back to Hey Adam G. Diver Online Inspirational Talk Show. She needs no further introduction in the pageant world as she is the American queen who inspires us through the excellence she commits to her craft and her passion for the environment. And now, as the reigning Miss Earth May 2021, her confidence is really soaring, soaring higher than ever before as she reaches for the gold and advocate for a greener tomorrow. So without further ado, let's all welcome her. Please say hello to Miss Earth Main 2021, Marissa Page Butler, live all the way from her hometown in Maine. Hello. Adam, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> you look like Simena. Oh my God. <laughs> I hear that a lot as my favorite compliment. <laughs> yes. Uh, even your back, you not only look beautiful, but you really look amazing within that echo video that you did. Wow. Thank you. It Thank seems, you so much. We, it seems that we have gotten to know you a lot so much in that three minute video package that you are sending for your for your for the forthcoming Miss Earth USA competition. <laughs> Yeah. So, no, I just wanted to make sure that when people saw that I was going over to Miss Earth USA, I wanted to really share the environmental advocacy work that I have been working on since I was a little girl. This has been something that has been so integral to who I am as a person. Uh, and I just really wanted to showcase that, especially now that I am in a pageant system that really champions environmental advocacy. So what's your current mindset, right? Was my current it, mindset? Is it green? Is it uh, getting more, getting greener? <laughs> in the next I would say that I've always been, uh, I've always focused on environmental work in the past since I was a little girl. Um, but since joining Miss Earth USA, I've been even trying to push that envelope even further. Uh, so I actually cut out all beef from my diet. I was actually vegetarian for a little while, but I need to figure that out a little bit more because I was getting a little bit sick. So I wasn't getting enough protein, but I would like to eventually move to being 100% vegetarian again uh, when that's a little bit more uh, feasible for me when I have a, more knowledge on how to get the protein I need. Um, but so yeah, I'd say that I've been changing out a bunch of different things within my life. Actually, the makeup I'm wearing right now is from an environmentally uh, conscious wow. line. So it's, you know, all these little things that you'll change throughout your day-to-day -day life. And I say that Miss Earth USA has definitely inspired me to do more uh, towards a green mindset than I did before, even though it was extensive prior to joining the pageant already. Even your background screams Miss Earth. Could Even your background couldn't agree more. It looks so green. I feel like, you know, you're ready for your intelligence segment. Oh, thank you. Well, <laughs> of the competition. Actually, this is my house in Maine. Um, so as I spoke about in the video, my mother was always a very big inspiration to me for my environmental work. Uh, and as you can see, she has plants all around our house. It's almost like we live in a greenhouse, which is nice because in Maine, it's very cold there's a lot of snow on the ground right now so to be able to be around live plants indoors it definitely helps with those you know the winter blues so to speak it, being surrounded by plants has always been something that makes me personally feel better just because it's what i grew up with so how have you been adjusting to the weather considering that san diego is you know <laughs> kind of uh sunny always sunny all the time while you know maine has is close to new york yeah so for sure so, it's snowy there right now it's snowing the, right now yeah. the day that i got here we had what was called a nor'easter so if you it's a snowstorm that looks similar to that of a hurricane uh so as you can imagine we got a lot of snow uh right when i first got here but uh i luckily had all my old snow gear that i had here in maine so i was able to stay warm uh but my have two little nieces and a nephew. And so we've been playing out in the snow, going sledding, and it's just been a complete blast. Uh, you know, as someone who 
moved away because I didn't want to live in the snow. <laughs> it's <laughs> nice though to be able to come back and just enjoy it and not have to, you know, shovel your car out or wake up extra early just to de-ice your car. Uh, so those types of things I didn't like about living in Maine when I was younger. Uh, I just did not like to shovel, did not like to drive in the snow. Uh, but now that I'm just home and visiting, it's fun and it's exciting because I get to just go play with my nieces and nephews and it's a uh, fun thing instead of a stressful thing now. <laughs> oh, that's nice here because you get to see snow once in a while now because you're based in San Diego. Exactly. So for sure, but, but for sure, after the holiday yes. season, Short you'll be... periods of time is how I like yeah. to have my snow. <laughs> <laughs> but for sure, after, you know, yeah, like you said, if you, you'll be happier after the holiday season because you'll be going to... You're, you'll be flying to Orlando, Florida yes. for the competition. So it's oh, also very, there too. I'm very excited for that. Um, so yeah. I actually spent quite an extensive amount of time in Florida too. So I have a lot of family down there. So I'm really excited that the pageant got located there because it's going to be a week after my birthday. And because of the location, I'll actually get to see a lot of members of my family that I haven't been able to see for a very long time because they're in a uh, they're in Florida. So they're actually oh. going to come to the pageant. So I'm very, very excited for that. I'm really glad that I got moved to Orlando. Yes. Wait, uh, do you have uh, Spanish blood? Uh, do you have... Uh... Spanish, yes. So um, I'm, I'm kind of a mix of a lot of little things here and there. Um, but mostly I'm Irish, Spanish, French, and oh. a little bit of Native American as well. Uh, so there is a, a big difference between on my mom's side and my dad's side as well. My dad's just, you know, Irish and English, <laughs> but my mom is where we got all the, you know, what I'd say the cool parts. <laughs> so she's definitely uh, where we got the Native American, French, uh, a Canadian part of me. Uh, so it's a little bit of a mix of a few things. <laughs> You know, the reason why I asked you that question is because, you know, as I said earlier, you really look like Simena from different Aww. angles. I swear, Simena Navareta, the former Miss Universe from Mexico. So, yes, the fir uh, first thing when I saw your picture, I thought, like, oh, my God, she look, she look like Simena. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. She was a, one of actually the pageant girls that got me into pageantry in the first place. So she, as you know, was Miss Universe in 2010. Uh, and I started pageants uh, the very next year in 2011 after seeing her reign. Uh, so she and Layla was also uh, kind of inspirations for me to get into pageantry when I was 17. Uh, so that was, uh, it's really nice when I hear that people think that I look like her because she was an inspiration for me to join this beautiful pageant community in the first place. So I always love to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, uh, before we proceed, uh, there are so many people tuned in. Uh, Linnea Valenciano is watching. Thank Hi, you, Linnea, for tuning. Trisha is also greeting us. Hello, Earthlings. Hello, Hi, Trisha. Trisha. <laughs> and then Rex Valle is also sending his love to us. Uh, hello, good evening, Miss Marissa. I'm watching. Good evening. With you. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Appreciate it. <laughs> When you get messages like this, how does how is it? Uh, how are you taking this with respect to how you are preparing for your upcoming competition? Well, I think that out of all the pageants that I've done, I feel like I have more support uh, for this competition from the fans and and from citizens around the world. And it's it's almost a little overwhelming, but also it. it really gives me a lot of drive and dedication to really try my absolute hardest at this pageant and work continuously hard because I know that so many people are supporting me and believing in me. So it, it makes me want to do well for the fans and do well for my supporters. So I, it definitely has been a source of confidence and inspiration for me. So I really appreciate everyone who always tunes into my interviews and gets to know me a little bit more. I've really enjoyed being able to share my story with you and my journey with you as well. Yes, you know, I must say, of course, you're a very great candidate. You know, you've been preparing so much for this competition. We can see that. But I can see that your fan base is also growing because of the renewed interest about Miss Earth USA pageant since, yes. yeah, as we all know, Lindsay Coffee is the rain is the newly crowned Miss Earth. So yes, how, yes, <laughs> how are you relating this to your preparation right now as well? 
Well, I think that uh, with Lindsay winning, uh, it really shows that the, whoever is going to step into that Miss Earth USA position has really big shoes to fill. And she has to realize she's representing the next wave of Miss Earth USA in the United States. So I think if we were able to have strong showing in the next couple of years, it'll really help build the program in the United States, which I, it has been happening since we have uh, Laura come in with as the director. It's been such an amazing experience of being part of the organization under her. So I think that being able to showcase that America is here to stay at Miss Earth is so important in building our organization going forward because like you said right now all eyes right now are on Miss Earth USA for probably one of the first times they're having it this much of uh, attention it. towards us so it's really great and then we need to be able to capitalize on that and really show that we have the capability of a back-to-back -back. we have such an amazing team we have such amazing contestants and I think it's now is time to show the earth that USA is here to stay. Speaking of back to back, you mentioned it yourself. How do you feel many, many fans are already tagging you as one of the contenders who could really give that back to back win for the USA this year, considering that the competition hasn't even started yet? <laughs> well, I, again, it gives me a really great source of uh, confidence and purpose going into Miss Earth USA. Um, but at the same time, like I said, it's really because of how great of a team we have at Miss Earth USA that I truly believe that is possible. Uh, so as far as in my background and my pageant journey, this would be the first time I've had a really solid team behind me. Uh, so I'm really excited to see how far we can go with that. And I, I do think with the right people, anything is possible. So I think that we're in the right time, the right place with the right people for Miss Earth USA to really shine on the Miss Earth stage. So I'm just hoping that I get the opportunity to be that delegate, to be able to show the world that Miss Earth USA is going to be one of those sash factor countries going forward for Miss Earth. So you don't mind the pressure at all? I love the pressure. I'd say that as far as my personality goes, I always thrive under high pressure situations. I am the type of person who almost it operates better when I spread myself really thin and I'm doing a million different things. Uh, so I say pressure for me has always been uh, something very positive that I've always looked for. I mean, I was a three sport division two athlete, you know, <laughs> and so I'm really used to pressure and, and high stake uh, situations. So I think that it almost lights kind of a fire for me to be able to have that push. And, and really, like I said, it gives me the inspiration to work harder than I ever have before in a pageant. So, cause I want to make sure that I don't let the fans down who believe in me. So it's really important to me that I really am trying my hardest to be able to honor the support that all the fans have been placing in me over these past few months. Uh, you know, I'm, yeah, true. So what makes you, uh, I'm curious to ask, you're competing, at, you, you know, you've been competing, you've been competing as a pageant girl ever since, and but now you're competing, but now it's kind of um, unique because you're competing at a time of pandemic. So uh, how, are there any difference when it comes to competing in a pageant under this new normal compared to the old times? to the old, old normal you used to have? Yes, well, I mean, the, the actual setup of the pageant is going to be a little bit different. We'll have our judges interview prior to arriving in Orlando. So that will actually be through a Zoom meeting similar to what we're doing now. So it's, it's great to be able to have that practice. Um, but in general, it's been, I, I think the difficult part about competing during pandemic is just the uncertainty. So. Uh, as you know, the pageant was originally scheduled for August, uh, and so we were doing all the preparations to get ready for that date, and then it gets moved. So you have to be able to learn to kind of adjust your uh, preparations and and re um, and kind of redirect it to the new date once that had been given. So I say that it just 
it made it so I had to be prepared all year long, which is what you would have to do as Miss Earth USA anyways, and as Miss Earth. So I think it's amazing practice. Um, but I would say that the other thing is, is just as far as appearances go, uh, you have to be very careful about where you go and how you are interacting with people just because we need to make sure that we are doing it as safely as possible. Yes. So pretty much all the, um, any of the appearances that I've been doing has been part of my We Clean Trails organization. And we all wear masks, it's always outside, and we always are very socially distanced. And we haven't had one incident with our uh, organization for the entire 21 events that we put on in 2020. So I think that we were do doing a really amazing job. But it, it does kind of change the role of uh, being a pageant title holder to being more online and doing more interviews such as this rather than in-person appearances. But again, it's just another challenge. It's another thing to learn. And it's something you would have to do anyways as Miss Earth USA or as Miss Earth, no matter what time it, what the pageant took place. So it's great preparation. So for sure, you have been impressing the judge just as early as now through your Zoom interviews with your, by your incredible resume. I read in your bio that you, you are currently working as a financial advisor. Yes, I am. Uh, it's a really interesting career path to be in as a young woman, simply because there really is no other people within my industry, uh, at least within my company, that are a similar age or gender to me. So my uh, it's very male dominated being a financial advisor of only 31% of women uh, are financial advisors, well, only 31% of financial advisors are women. Um, and it even gets a smaller percentage as you get higher up with different certifications. So like a CFA a designation, for example, only 13% of CFAs are women. And that is a goal of mine to be a CFA someday. It is a, a four-ish year process, um, but it's very difficult. Most people do not even pass level one of those exams. So that's going to be something I'm going to tackle after pageantry when I have a little bit more time. Uh, but it is a little weird being the only woman in the room at almost every single meeting uh, and also the youngest by about 30 years. But I'm learning so much and I think that it will just set me up to be very successful later on in my life. I can help my parents with their retirement plans and you know, it, it's, it's been a kind of interesting year working as a financial advisor and we yes. did move uh, remotely, um, but that also gives me the opportunity to come home for the first time in four years for Christmas with my family. So I there is that silver lining uh, that this is kind of showing our industry that we don't, as an industry, as financial advisors, necessarily need to go into the office to get our job done. It is something we can do remotely. And that is also contributing to lower uh, greenhouse emissions because there's less people on the road traveling into work. And I'm very happy to say that my company has actually said that we can continue working from home even after the pandemic if we want to, so we can help contribute to uh, less uh, traffic uh, and the commute uh, in our city of San Diego, because we do have a lot of commuters. And so that is a very big source of greenhouse emissions in our state. So I think that that would be a wonderful thing to show businesses across the United States and across the world that if your job can be done remote, to please let your uh, employees have that opportunity because that would just only contribute to a greener world. Um, and then also more time that you get to spend with family as well. And so I, I think that that would just be a good thing, not only for families, but for Mother Earth as well. So are you saying, yeah, so, yeah, you, you just answered my next question. I was about to say, so do you think, so do you think um, it's favorable, favorable to the environment considering, considering that there's less carbon footprint? Yeah. Yes, definitely. I, I'm just being someone who is from a city like San Diego, you can visually see the difference. So a, a trip that would usually take us about a half an hour to drive takes about 10 minutes now. There's so many less people who are on the road and you can actually see the mountainsides much more clearly. Uh, so it's something that not only you can physically see, but you're also seeing that, you know, plants and animals, they're able to have a little bit more of a breathing room and be able to really recover during this time. So you know, there is that silver lining to this pandemic as a whole 
that you know Mother Earth is giving it getting a chance to heal herself. And hopefully it's also showing us that there's a different way to approach how we had lived our life and in to take what the lessons we learned from this pandemic into the future so that we can continue the this um, positive movement for Mother Earth's healing going forward. So for you, this is a great reset button. Well, exactly. So I always say that humans are the biggest procrastinators out of all the animal kingdom. So if we are not forced to do something, usually it doesn't happen until the very last minute. Uh, so this has actually forced us to find different ways to approach our lives um, in a way that we've never seen before in our lifetime. So it is that big reset button that is forcing us to uh, kind of think of different processes on how we go about our day-to-day -day life. Yes, yes, exactly. I think Mother Earth needs to breathe yes. for a change, you know, considering that you know, but I'm glad that you're thriving even at this time of pandemic. No, I wonder how have you been doing your extracurricular or extracurricular curricular activities, considering that you know we're only yes. <laughs> we have been experiencing cabin <laughs> fever, you know, since we're always since we're always stuck at home. Because I understand you love you love to hike, you do do a lot of outdoor activities. So for sure, it must have been hard for you. Uh, so at least in San Diego, as long as you are outside, there is a lot of space to be able to keep that six feet distance. Everyone is being very wonderful about wearing their masks. So I do feel so comfortable going for hikes. Um, I'm so fortunate I got my dog during this time. I got my dog Milo uh, in February. So that was a little bit before um, the shutdowns initially started. And if I didn't have him, I probably would have gone a little crazy. Uh, so be able to have him and you know taking him to dog parks and to the dog beach uh, is really giving me you know, a little bit more things to do. Uh, but I've always been a little bit more of a homebody uh, as far as my extracurriculars go. It's usually always been uh, active in nature. So whether it's working out at the gym, playing a team sport, um, going hiking, going kayaking, yes. all those things. And a lot of those things we can still do, uh, except for the gym. Uh, so now I've been working out outdoors. Uh, and that's actually been a really new challenge for me, but it's been so wonderful. It's actually amazing to be able to work out outside, especially being in San Diego, where it is beautiful all year long. So even in the middle of December, we were able to work outside with absolutely no problem. It was a little bit cold because I do work out about you know, 6 a.m. sometimes so it's still kind of cold from the night but it's definitely doable in my city so I'm very thankful for the fact that I live where I live so I was able to still continue on with a lot of my uh, loves uh, outdoors and just kind of shift it and change it like I said it's right now it's about kind of finding alternative ways to approach the same thing so you can continue to do the things you love but just make sure that you're doing them in a safe way exactly exactly you wouldn't want to risk your health especially now at this time yeah we really have to take all the extra precautions that we could get in order for us to remain healthy because you know those covid tests those swab tests are so expensive <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, luckily yes. in Maine, though, uh, we can get free testing. So that oh, has been cool. amazing. Uh, it wasn't that way the whole time, but I did when I landed, I got tested and got tested again a few days later. So uh, we were definitely making sure we we're being very cautious with that as well, because traveling across the country right now isn't necessarily the easiest thing to do. So and you want to make sure, especially when you're coming home and seeing loved ones who do have immune uh, compromised, uh, you, you're doing it as safely as possible. So luckily, the way that our home is set up, where we have different wings of the house is, is kind of big and set out that way, just because in Maine, everything's pretty big and because <laughs> we have a lot of space. Um, so it, it was really fortunate that I was able to kind of quarantine until I got that test done. And now that, I, that we've got that negative test, I've been able to interact with my family. So it's been really wonderful that state of Maine had the free testing. That way I was able to do it multiple times once I got here without it being a big financial burden. I see. You know, whenever now I'm now that I'm listening to you, I love that how you have been highlighting 
uh, for us people to be active through your outdoor activities, especially given this time of situation that we are in right now. But what I also love about you is also, you mentioned him, Milo, your love for Milo. It's really, uh, is, is your love for Milo your pet? Um, the reason why, you know, you have so much love for the animals. Well, I'd say that it kind of started the opposite way. So my mother really instilled that love for animals in me at a very young age. So where we live, actually, right on the other side of this wall here, there is a yes. wildlife preserve. So my uh, my property borders a wildlife preserve. So we see so many animals ever since I was a little girl. We get deer, we get chipmunk, we get there's moose and beavers and I knew so many animals that I got to see so up close and personal as a child just because it's right out my window. Uh, and we also helped my mom. We would find animals that might have been injured or orphaned uh, baby animals. And my mom would always take them to the Center for Wildlife in Maine uh, to have them rehabilitated and then released back out into the wild. So I, from a very young age, I was surrounded by animals. And my mother, we always joke that she's Snow White. So animals <laughs> love my mother. If you go out onto our front porch, uh, the chipmunks will literally crawl up onto your shoulder and beg for food from you. And they've always done that. I can't even remember a time from when I was a, a baby that the chipmunks weren't extremely friendly. Um, and so it's just, it's, we kind of grew up with Snow White as a personality type, as a mother. So, of course, that love for animals followed. But I would definitely say that since I got Milo, my love for animals has only intensified just because when you're around an animal and you really get to know them at that base level, that you see how much intelligence there is. You see how much of a personality, how much empathy and love that they can give you. And so that's actually what made me decide to go vegetarian this year. Um, like I said, now I, I do still eat fish and chicken as of now. That is something I want to cut out eventually. But uh, after having Milo, I ended up cutting out uh, beef for sure. And that's been wonderful. Uh, I, I actually have been feeling great about cutting out beef from my diet. And that's actually the easiest way if you wanted to make a change to your diet to have a positive effect on the environment is to cut out beef just because it takes so much water, oh. so much resources, land, uh, deforestation just to harvest as many uh, cows to be able to provide for the beef industry. It's actually the most environmentally detrimental um, meat industry is beef. So by cutting that out, at least I'm able to start moving in that direction. And once I learn a little bit more about getting proper protein in, I'll be cutting out the fish and chicken as well and going back to 100% vegetarian lifestyle. Wow. I, wow. No words. You know, you have really you really have altered your mindset or yeah. you know change your lifestyle for the better just yeah. with her well, love for for my for for milo and the animals you know is this your inspiration behind your advocacy for miss earth usa so my mother definitely is my inspiration behind my advocacy for miss earth usa uh just because she really modeled that to me from a really young age that every single animal is important. I remember very vividly helping her uh, when I was really young, even help rehabilitate mice. So mice, most people see as, you know, a pest. And if they find them, you know, they usually end up trying to kill them because it's classified more as a pest. But my mother found an injured mouse and she actually nursed it back to health and we were able to release it back into the wild. And so to be able to see that my mother had such a love for every single type of animal, no matter how small or what other people might have thought about that animal, uh, it really inspired me to have a compassionate heart for all animals. Uh, so that's kind of where I, I started looking to get involved when I left uh, my home and was no longer able to interact with animals uh, in the same capacity when I was with my mother. So I looked for new uh, new ways to get involved with other animals. So when I went to college, that's when I got involved with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association's Cooperative Shark Tagging Program. And so that was actually a really, really fun um, 
really fun introduction to uh, data collection with a biologist. So we would actually go out, uh, we worked between Nantucket and Massachusetts and then all the way down to Puerto Rico. Um, and we would be tagging sharks. Uh, so yes, that was one shark that we tagged. Um, and so all <laughs> the sharks, they're caught and released. They're released back within two minutes. Uh, and the guidelines that NOAA gives is always, uh, as long as you get back in the water before five minutes. There has been studies that we also participated in that showed they had a 100% survival rate for being caught in this manner and released. So we were able to get the information we needed without having to do any long-term negative effects to them and to be able to get that information. So we would take measurements, blood samples, you know, identify the gender, uh, determine if it was pregnant, if it was a female, you know, taking all these notations. And then we would send that information into NOAA and then they would go ahead and do all the research. So then, then they would make uh, changes to laws. So one of the things I was really proud about during my time uh, volunteering was our data was actually used to help place stricter fishing restrictions on the Atlantic mako shark. So that was to help preserve their dwindling population and is essentially, you know, taking stock of what we have in our oceans and making adjustments on our laws and regulations to make sure that we are not overfishing one type of species um, or if there was too much of another species, you know, making sure we're shifting that demand to that species. So it's a little bit more sustainable long term. So we're not making any type of huge changes to the ecosystems that are in the oceans. And sharks are so vital to that ecosystem because they do act as not only a lot of them are at the top of the food chain, but uh, many of them also act as kind of the garbage collectors. Uh, so most sharks actually aren't, uh, you know, that predatory. They usually end up uh, picking off the sick or they will clean up the dead uh, carcasses of other animals in the ocean. So it kind of keeps the uh, oceans a little bit cleaner that way. So they're really integral for many different reasons. So it was really amazing to be able to work so closely and alongside them and working with a biologist too was an amazing experience just to be able to learn so much about the animals more so than you would just, you know, if you were going fishing for them with, uh, you know, some recreational anglers being able to fish with a biologist. It just gave me such a deeper understanding of what it was we were doing, why it was so important, and more information about those animals as well. So that was an amazing, amazing experience that I got to have during college and probably wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. It's one of my favorite volunteer experiences that I have had so far. Yeah, it's nice to know that your vol volunteerism has led you to create this, uh, yeah, this uh, wildlife conservation and preservation project, such as what you have been advocating now, co the collective, which is uh, entitled the collective word. So, can you tell us more about it? Is it similar to your, to the previous shark uh, tagging project that you have, that you have been very passionate about? So I say that it that does fall under the general umbrella of my advocacy. Um, but I say the main focus of the collective earth is to build. Um, so it would be land ethics to build land ethics within our community. And so when I say ethics, that means that ethics usually they are mean that they are kind of moral compasses on how we treat other people who belong to our community so that we all can be mutually beneficial of all those actions and so when we say land ethic we're expanding that definition of community to not only include other people but also to include the plants and animals that call this place home and that even extends as far down to our natural Resources. So respecting uh, respect comes into huge play for respecting animals, respecting you know our clean water, respecting our natural resources. Uh, because when we do that, we will adjust our way of of approaching um, how we do things and making sure that we're doing it in a way that's the least detrimental to everyone in our community and including all of our natural resources and our biggest animals. So essentially my goal with, with my advocacy would be to instill these land ethics in people within my community so that when they are making those big decisions on say where to build a house 
or where to build a company or or how to source their materials if they're a business you know making sure that those are those decisions are also encompassing the best intentions for the plants animals and natural resources in their community as well um, and so the real way you can really build that land ethic, the easiest way is exposure to nature uh, for the people that you are trying to teach that land ethic to. So I think the best way to do that would be to uh, require more uh, trips to national and state parks for students um, with their, while they're in school, uh, teaching them. So I'm also a Leave No Trace, a certified trainer. So, and that kind of teaches you how to respect nature once you're there. So I think it'd be really important to have that type of education placed in our school systems. Um, and then, you know, we're also sharing our love for nature through video and photo and really showing people the beauty that nature has in of itself and that isn't necessarily tied to what gain humans might be able to get from it. it they have that intrinsic value, so the value that they have separate from any type of use that humans could have for that. And it's really important to respect that they are their own separate thing that deserves respect. So that's kind of my goal uh, with my advocacy is to kind of teach those that land ethic, uh, teach that respect for nature. Um, and in turn, that does help preserve the habitats uh, for the endangered plants and animals. And it's so important in the United States just because one in five plants and animals in the United States are at risk for extinction. So, and out of the over it's about 1,300 plants and animals in the United States, 200 of those are located in San Diego County where I live. So it's so important to not only where I live, but for our entire country that we are really making sure that we respect the land that we share with all these plants and animals and making sure that every single uh, living being on this earth has a fair shot at a successful life. Nice, you know, wow. Crown. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I want to give a follow, ask a follow up question before I go to the comment section. You know, you talk about land ethic, you know, respect for habitat, for nature. You know, I want to be, I want to ask you a, a bit controversial question because I feel like, you know, I wish. There were people like you in China right now, so that this pandemic would mm -hmm. would have never taken place or never existed at all if we just truly respected our mm -hmm. animal, our animal or the wildlife. It began with you know with animals transmitting the or the virus to the. Mm -hmm. to the humans so you know when you talk about it how come there is such a disconnect between what you espouse and what and the practices that you know all these uh other citizens in the world have been doing yes well i say that the their main issue is um the way in which our culture has taught us to treat animals in the past. So animals historically have always been a source of food. They've always been seen as a resource instead of being something that has its own intrinsic value, as I said. Um, so they oftentimes uh, animals, people desensitize you to animals saying, oh, they're not intelligent enough or oh, they can't feel pain or or they don't have emotions. and. And while with some animals that might be true, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's okay to treat them that way. Uh, just because as humans, we have the capability to see the consequences of our actions. We are able to think about that before we make our decisions. So I think it's more up to us as humans to be able to say, this is our responsibility because we're the only animals here that can have that foresight to see into the future. So we really are the guardians of this earth, but unfortunately we've been seeing the earth as something that it belongs to us instead of something that we belong to. Um, because at the end of the day, we belong to the earth and it's our responsibility to um, preserve that because it's, we're the ones that can. 
out of all the animals on this planet, we are the ones that have the best ability to make a real change, uh, to be able to preserve our world going forward in the future. We need to think of not only just ourselves when we are making those decisions on how to preserve the world, but also for every other living being because it is our responsibility as the only animals with the ability to, in that foresight to be able to see into the future as far as the consequences to our actions. So it's, I think it's really about showing that it's our responsibility uh, and that it's not just something that the world isn't, it's not there for our gain. We are here for his protection. It is not here for us to exploit. Um, and so that is a real big cultural shift that would need to happen across the world. And I think that Lindsay has kind of touched on this a few times is that we're not just citizens of our country. We're citizens of this world. And so are all the plants and animals. And we need to be treating each other as equals in that fact that we all deserve to have a place on this earth and I deserve to have an earth that is able to sustain us all moving forward. Um, but at the end of the day, that responsibility is on us because we are the beings that can really make that difference going forward. Nice. You know, you talk about that responsibility. Do you think um, we could achieve that responsibility in such a way that we could strike a balance between, you know, um, sustaining human needs and preserving the biodiversity? I definitely think so. Uh, so I, I'm not here to say everyone in the world should be vegetarian. I understand that that's not necessarily feasible, but I will say that if more people were vegetarian, it would actually pr preserve more of our land that we use for agriculture that we could use for uh, plants and forestation that actually help contribute to lowering our CO2 emissions. So if we make sure that we keep enough uh, land dedicated to forests, dedicated to wildlife habitat, that not only is positive for those animals, but it's positive for us humans as well because it combats that climate change that is affecting all of us because climate change doesn't just affect animals, climate change affects humans too. And usually it's disproportionately for those who are poor or in minority groups because the areas that have the highest instances of pollution and the people who are usually not able to combat that in other ways are people who don't have access to the funds to be able to uh, make those changes. So it's really important that we are focusing on uh, seeing a preservation for all of us uh, because when we help animals in turn their habitat helps us like I said by lowering those CO2 emissions with all the extra forestation so in general it is really important to just define that balance um, because there is a balance to be had uh, so it's really important to see that he, the human mind is the most valuable resource in this world because we can look at the same problem from a different perspective a million different times and come up with a new and better solution, something more efficient, something more equitable. Uh, and that is really important that we never settle, that we're never co uh, content with how the world is now because it can always be better. And, you know, I think that that's so important that we are advocating for people to constantly find ways to change this world for the better because it is possible as we've seen throughout human history we have solved so many problems that we had in the past and have done so in a much more efficient and equitable way in other areas and now we need to take that same effort and focus and put that towards our environment problem which is global warming and like i said combining my platform of the collective earth that in turn contributes to reducing uh, the effects of global warming so it all is interconnected and we just need to find a way in which we are able to operate in this world where all those connected pieces uh, do the least amount of damage to every single living being on this earth um, because that is a way for a more greener more equitable tomorrow Yes, everything leads to what we do towards how climate change is really changing or affecting our lives for the worse. So do you think it's one problem that is the most pressing issue our current generation is facing? 
So I say that is like I said, humans are big procrastinators. And I say that that is our biggest flaw as the human race is that oftentimes we're we get very complacent with how the status quo is. And instead of looking for a new um, way to approach an old problem, we just kind of, if we're comfortable and, and it doesn't really affect us personally, we tend to not look outside ourselves. And if it's not eminent, it tends to not get done. So I, I think that just our procrastination to many different problems is our biggest uh, flaw. And especially in the United States, I think one of the things that we are procrastinating on is coming together as, uh, as a collective community, not only with each other as U.S. citizens, but with other citizens around the world. We've become so divisive here and so set in our own ways of thinking that our divide in our country has become so vast. And when you Again, it's about not accepting that you know we can change our ways of thinking, that we can move forward and find new solutions. And it's thinking that we have all the answers. It's thinking that our way of doing things is the only way of doing things that contributes to the negatives uh, never going away. So it's really important to realize that just because you think you know something doesn't mean you do. Uh, my dad has always said that the most intelligent people in the world believe that they know nothing because they are so open-minded to a new possibility, something new and to stay curious. He always told me that if you think that you are 100% thinking of one thing, research as much as you can on the other side so you can understand them at least because it's when we come together it is when we are able to make the biggest impact in this world and you cannot do that when you are fighting you cannot do that when you're yelling uh, the only way you're able to bring people onto your side of thinking is to truly understand why they think that the way that they do so that you can have a better way of attacking that issue speaking to them in terms that they will understand so that they can then understand your way of thinking and come onto your side of things. So I say it's our procrastination and our inability to really come together. Uh, and I think that those two things are also still related as well. Yeah, exactly. So given with what you said, are you even more hopeful that this new administration will be more environmental friendly or we'll be doing, you know, more environment a loss that will be benefiting our environment in the next four years. I definitely do think that. I, I know we've already agreed to join rejoin the Paris Accord, so our new administration has um, indicated that that is something that they're going to be doing in the very first, you know, hundred days of their new administration, um, and so that's really a promising uh, indicator of how they're going to be treating. Uh, environmental legislation going forward as well, uh, because if we're not part of the conversation, we can't be part of the solutions. So I really am glad to see that we are moving back a little bit more towards more environmental protections um, in the United States, uh, especially since it's so important to our natural wildlife spaces that we have. Um, Alaska, for example, um, our previous administration was considering selling that off to oil and gas uh, company and I for drilling. And I personally think that since that's one of our last natural, like huge wilderness locations, I, I would hate to see that happen. So I, I'm hopeful as well that our administration does not move forward with those plans um, that they had had from the previous administration. Um, and since, you know, they have indicated that they are looking to increase more green jobs they're in increasing green um, infrastructure and then also rejoining the Paris Accord. That does give me a lot of yes. positive feelings um, for the environmental aspect of this administration. You know, you talk about uh, you talk about uh, people should be joining the conversation about you know about top environmental topics like climate change, deforestation, global warming. So, how do you feel when? This administ this uh, this outgoing administration seems to be out of touch with with reality, considering that they treat um, the it treats uh, the global climbing the global climbing the global <laughs> warming problem or the climate change problem non-existent, mythical. 
-hmm. and even you know our or even would criticize activists like Greta Thunberg that um it's really not a relevant issue to be discussed yes well i think that the problem the old administration had is that they didn't want to be the ones contributing the vast amount of funds to it they they wanted other countries to be contributing more funds to this cause but in my opinion like i said as we are stewards of this earth it is our responsibility if we have the resources and we have the ability to help the environment i think that that is our responsibility as global citizens uh so it's again as far as the people who believe though that it is mythical or it isn't real um i again you never win an argument when you are yelling at someone. So the best way to really convince them is to show them with facts and figures and to talk to them logically and calmly. And again, one of the things that I think that helps make people understand is that immersive experience into nature. So I think that if, if someone really didn't believe in what I was saying, I would say, hey, do you want to come on one of my cleanups? And you can see just firsthand on this one, two and a half mile stretch of trail that we're going to go walk on how much litter there is and then also showing them how many endangered plants and animals also call that same two and a half mile stretch home that might be negatively affected so kind of showing them with facts and figures and then also giving them the experience to go into nature and to fall in love with nature because i truly feel that that respect comes first from love you can't uh, you you can't teach someone to love something just by giving them facts and figures you have to also immerse them in nature so that they can really appreciate what it is we're protecting in the first place uh, because without that love then they don't really they think about the things that they do love so they think about themselves they think about their family they think about their financial uh, gains that they can have but when you add in the beauty of nature um, to the things that they love, it's much easier to um, convince them to protect it because it becomes something that you would protect the same as you would protect your family if it's something that you love. So I think it starts with exposing them to the beauty of nature, teaching them with the facts and figures, and then making sure you're doing that in a calm and concise way because if we are combative and like, oh, well, if you don't think that the global warming is real, like you're crazy, you know, like that approach does not work for people. If you want to change someone's mind, you really have to get on their level, get to know them and try a different approach than yelling because you will never convince someone of your point if you are just uh, isolating them from you. Uh, so that would be my advice for people who are approaching, uh, people who believe God, global warming is a myth. Take them into nature, show them what it is we're protecting, and teach them the facts and figures to support the evidence of global warming after that point. So do you think if you were to sit down with a world leader, 